let's start so we were talking about the uh, the intertemporal model in the monetary uh, i would say context so we were trying to understand that how we can derive the monetary intertemporal model and we uh, in the last uh, last last session we also discuss with the rational expectation so here we'll be talking and we'll be trying to derive the similar kind of picture that we have uh, we have covered for the intertemporal consumption model so it will look similar to that but here we'll be trying to add some more dimension of, about the demand for money supply of money the neutrality of money that the concept we have i would say we will also talk about the classical dichotomy the controversy and towards the end we'll be going and examining the uh, the conventional and unconventional monetary policy under that we'll be having the understanding about the quantitative easing and then we will have the negative interest rate so with this background let's start with the session uh, where we were discussing about or formulating the monetary intertemporal model the ingredients of the monetary intertemporal model so here it looks like so here you have the the reference book remains same stephen de williamson and i am referring the same book here the objective remains same so we'll be trying to arrive at the monetary intertemporal model we'll be superimposing the fisherian idea and trying to understand that how the real context can play a very important role then here we have then we'll be trying to derive the competitive equilibrium from there we'll initiate the debate of neutrality so neutrality will be introduced here and then the effectiveness of conventional and unconventional monetary policy these things we have already covered so let's not waste time here we are we were talking about the different alternatives of making payments so money has of course facilitated the transaction now it is much easier to purchase or sell a particular asset but at the same time the evolution of technology and further developments in the financial sector especially in the domain of banking it has facilitated the transaction in a much uh, bigger way so conventionally if you have a cash you can buy a certain goods but you have some provisions through which even if you don't have cash you will be given the interest free period and then you can even if you don't have money uh, right now in the current period you can still uh, facilitate your transaction and whatever is the interest period given within that period of time you are supposed to clear the dues so that kind of uh, uh, an alternative arrangement that we have in the monetary market it is called the credit card so we'll be introducing the credit card into our model to understand the monetary intertemporal framework so here what we say that the idea is that how credit card can be used as an alternative to currency or the transactions what we are trying to say that if an individual is having credit card and cash both how this individual will be deciding about when to use credit card and when to use cash so if the person is using cash or currency then what will be the situations in what all situation if i am trying to put a scenario wherein i am trying to give some incentive to the consumer that even if you have a cash and credit card you can still if if you have the nominal interest rate given a scenario a very high so if the nominal interest rate high in that scenario how this representative consumer or the consumer is going to react so whether when the interest rate is high he will be using more of credit card or cash or currency so that is the underlying idea so here you will have the two period in one period everyone transact so one period doesn't matter in future period you have the settlement taking place so that's the under, understanding here we are also introducing the consumer forms government the role of the government will be more prominent when we will be when we will be driving the demand for money and beyond when we are trying to see the intersection of equilibrium price means demand and supply of money so there the role of the government will be more visible with with the given set of debt or the bond market function it it has so goods purchased at price p no matter what means of payment whether credit card or currency so whatever you have the nominal price expressed it is in the form of the price so whatever goods are transacted by the whether it is consumer or whether it is the form whether it is government the the 
numerator is the, the price of the goods which is being transacted. Here uh, when we mention about credit cards, we have to also mention that bank will not offer the credit card at free of cost because bank also incurs some cost, additional cost. So, what are those costs? So, that could be uh, in the form of either the saving the history of the consumer or keeping the record of all the transactions whether the representative consumer is make, uh, using the card for transaction or making payment. The banks have to maintain the record. So, if banks are making the record, then they will incur the cost. There will be employees hired to look after those, uh, uh, those records. So, and because of that, each and every bank charges the credit card service. So, if you are choosing the credit card, if you are opting for credit card, you will have to incur some amount of cost. That is what the model assumes. So, here you have the credit card can be assumed. So, if you are going to use the credit card, then just, if you are going to use the credit card, so this is the uh, cost that you are incurring. So, the cost of credit card usage is nothing but Q per unit of goods purchase. So, whatever amount of goods you are purchasing, you are incurring some amount of cost. So, which means that if the individual is using the credit card, it, uh, so whatever is the credit limit of the credit card, so that credit card will be equivalent to the X is the output that the, uh, the consumer is going to buy and X, A, S is the supply and Q is the unit of the cost that the bank is charging for using. So, typically if you want to understand the credit card, how it works, those of you who are still students, uh, you may not have idea. So, credit card normally functions that you have the card provided by the bank, bank will issue a card so uh, and they will be charging the membership fee, that will be the cost. So, annual cost the bank charges. So, bank may be charging you 5000 rupees, 10000 rupees with the limit of credit limit of suppose 2 lakh, 3 lakh depending upon your monthly income. So, they will be deciding about or the annual income. Once they go, go for uh, giving you some kind of credit limit, so you have the option that once you purchase the credit card, then you will be allowed to make transaction up to the credit limit of the card based on your purchasing power. So, if you are using that card for transaction, then you do not have to pay immediately to the bank. You can pay that after, after one or two days, but you will be given 20 days or 18 days or more than 20 days interest free period. So, it means that whatever purchase or standing amount that you have on your card, you can settle within 20 days and then there will be last date of payment. If you are not making the payment, then bank will charge the rate of interest on the outstanding. So, the efficient use of a card is that you can use the card and then you can make that payment immediately after uh, or before the last date of making payment. Then bank will not charge anything except that the annual fees that banks charge. So, this is how it works. So, X, 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 SQ represents that. So, here you have the y axis which shows about uh, the price of credit card services and here you have the x axis that shows the real quantity of credit card services. Now, if you are seeing the line, it shows the upward trend. So, as you have the credit card services increasing, price will also increase. So, this, this is how you have. So, Q will also increase and Q is directly related to the quantity of credit card services. So, this is how we try and understand. So, let us start with the monetary intertemporal model, how it works. So, here suppose a consumer uses the credit card for transaction. So, if the consumer is going to use the credit card, it means that this representative consumer is going to have debt from the bank, so whatever amount that he will have. If he settles the amount in the current period itself, then it is fine. So, so the, this is the case that when the consumer uses the credit card, for transaction, he is seeking credit from the bank and settling the outstanding in the current period only. So, in the current period itself, he is settling the contract. The rate charge on this, so in the market, in the free market where you have the borrowing and lending taking place, the rate of interest offered in that market is suppose denoted by R. So, if R is the nominal interest rate at which borrowing and lending is taking place, then how we can decide about. 
So, suppose all agents, consumer firms and the government purchase why you need some good. So, if you are using the credit card, it means that you are demanding this much amount of good XDQ. So, y is the total amount. So, if you subtract y minus xdq, so it means that rest of the amount, what is the difference between y minus xdq, currency is being used. So, cash is being used for that. So, here if the if the representative consumer is making xdq by using the credit card, y minus xdq goes as a cash payment. So, here you have one more scenario like for example, suppose an economic agent considers buying one more unit of good with credit card and one less unit of good with currency. Now, here you have the scenario, this particular representative consumer suppose he wants to buy a particular, uh, a particular good, then he makes the tr transaction using the credit card and then the amount he has both credit card and cash, but he is making the card, he is using the card for transaction, keeping the cash with himself or herself. Now, what is the opportunity cost of holding the cash? Now, this is linked with the nominal interest rate. If the nominal interest rate is high, then the this consumer will be using the credit card and he will not be using the he will not be paying using currency because this currency he can keep it in the bank or lend it to somebody. At the rate of interest R, whatever amount that this representative consumer is or the consumer is going to get, if this R return is higher than what he is making as a cost of, of using the credit card, then he would always like to, which also means that if the return generated from this. Uh, lending, it is higher than the usage of credit card cost, then of course, this representative consumer would always like to use the credit card. So, it is linked with the interest rate scenario. So, how we can understand in a more formal way? The most likely scenario is P fewer units of currency to make transactions. So, whatever amount of money or currency that he is not using by using credit card, he is lending in the market and which in turn he is earning p into 1 plus r at the beginning of the future period. So, the, this is what he is going to get. Now, once the representative consumer arrives in the final period, we are talking about intertemporal. So, first period we do not have to worry about. In second period, now we are seeing the, the main role. So, this is the return by not using the cash. So, you are lending and you are getting p into 1 plus r. If you are using the credit card, then this is what you have. So, p into 1 plus q is the unit of money to settle the credit. So, whatever is the value of the product you have to or goods you have to settle the value. So, at the end of the future period this is what this representative consumer has to do. So, he has to settle this uh, this amount and with this return as long as the p into 1 plus r is greater than p into 1 plus q he would like to go for using the credit card he will not use the cash because this is giving more return than using the cash. So, if this particular representative consumer is experiencing a higher interest rate environment, then he would like to go for lending the, the money whatever he or she has than going for a simply using the credit card. So, this is the marginal benefit and this is the marginal cost. So, as long as these two are our in, in this case, if p into 1 plus r is less than p into 1 plus q, then he would like to go for using the currency. He will not use the credit card because he, even though he is going to lend the cash in the money market or anywhere, he is not going to get the return more than r. So, return is going to be lower. But if you have a r is equal to q, then this will imply that the agent will be indifferent between using the credit card or the currency. So, this is the underlying idea that if you have in the market, if the consumer is given the opportunity that you, he or she has the credit card and he or she also has some amount of currency. Now, given the in interest rate environment that we have, if the, the payoff from lending of the cash is higher then using the credit card, the consumer will be tempted to use more of a credit card. But if it reverses, then he would go back to cash. 
So in most of the economies, we often find that you have a lot of goodies attached with the credit card uh, for usage and this is one of the reasons that in the intertemporal context, if you put the credit card, then it is easier to understand the money market system, how it works and where the the rate of interest, the nominal rate of interest is the nodal parameter to deal with. So from here, we can think about how much I should hold the cash. So, so holding the cash, if you are holding your money for certain period and uh, given the interest rate environment, then this is directly linked to the demand for money. So now we will be talking in the context of demand for money. Supply of money is of course is, is in most of the models, the macroeconomic model it is considered as a genius variable. So we do not have but the demand for money becomes the indigenous part of the system and that is why demand for money understanding is crucial. Supply of money, it, it works on the time pattern that whether the individual, so the way we have dealt with the uh, the rational expectation in that we have already understood the idea that if you have the, the rational expectation playing a role in terms of higher money supply which means that people would expect that there will be higher rise in inflation. If you have higher rise in inflation then people would supply more amount of labor and work because they expect that the prices are going to be higher. But this you have to also understand that in which all uh, directions the money supply will increase whether this will directly increase by having the uh, pumping of the money or or a cheaper loan or it will be through a different channel so maybe the government is is using the sinorage to pump up the money so that may also be possible the helicopter effect and then you you also have the holding of bonds so you go for quantitative easing so those kind of uh, uh, methodology can be applied but demand for money understanding becomes crucial. So demand for money, it talks about whatever is the interest rate environment that you have when the individuals are tempted to hold more of cash. So here, this is the supply of credit card and this is the demand of credit card. So demand of credit card more or less it is horizontal. So here at this, so this is the demand that we have for the credit card, so real quantity. This is the price and so you can say that at equilibrium where you have the intersection of or the equilibrium point where you have the, the supply and demand crossing each other. So here it is X star. So here you can see the demand for credit card services, it is Q is equal to R is here. So here you will be indifferent. The moment it goes up, you will have more of a credit card leading. The moment you have a down, here more of a demand for credit card. So you can think with respect to the nominal interest rate how it is working. Now what happens when we have the uh, nominal interest rate higher? If the nominal interest rate higher and this demand for credit card is linked with the nominal rate of interest, so here we have the R. If R is increasing, it is bound to happen that your uh, demand for credit card service will increase and this will further will have the usage of more of credit card less of cash. So this is what the consumer will substitute credit card services for currency. They will not be using cash. So if you have a nominal interest rate higher, it means that people will be saving or lending money in the money market or, or to somebody and in the future period, whatever return they get, if it is higher than after settling the debt, then they are more than happy to use the credit card. So this is how it works. Now if you think about as I mentioned that Understanding the credit card and interest rate environment, especially with regard to putting cash in middle, we are able to understand that there is a, a, a some amount of cash holding taking place because of the interest rate scenario that the economy is facing. So here we have the demand for money and here demand for money, you can see it is determined by a price. This is the 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 I would say most of the goods and services are expressed in this price. Here you have the output or you, you can say real income minus X transpose R. So here you have the rate of interest decided. So rate of interest it is nothing but the nominal. Here you can see that demand for money is directly linked with the, with the real income which means that if you have income increasing the demand for money will also increase. But with interest rate 
it is having inverse relationship. The, if interest rate is increasing, people would like to hold more of cash. If interest rate is decreasing, people would like to release the cash. So, the, this is how it, it works. So, negative interest rates and ROUs are linked with this also. So, here x uh, star r is the equilibrium quantity. So, in a simple language, we can write it in this way that money demand is a, it depends upon the p l is represented for the function. So, here you have l y r. So, real income and the uh, rate of interest plays very important role in deciding about the demand for money. So, this is how it matters. So, here we have two in interesting cases based on this y and r. It says that increasing in real income more currency required as volume of transaction increases. So, this is what we call it as m v is equal to p t. So, once I have m v is equal to p t, then if transaction is increasing or then it can be linked with the demand for money also. So, how can we link it? If we have the real income increasing for the individual, so every one is seeing the rise in income, then it is bound to happen that there will be more transaction taking place and more transaction, the volume of transaction will decide about the, uh, the further usage of whether the alternative payment system will exist or whether how it will be decided. But here, this is having the direct link. This shows about the expansion scenarios in the economy. If you have the intervention coming from the nominal interest rate, then here you have to understand in a more clear way. The nominal interest rate is the opportunity cost of using currency in transaction and higher R implies that the, there will be more usage of credit card in transactions and less use of currency. Then you, here also you have the demand for money impacted. So, here increase in real income, this is what we are trying to understand, the increase in real income, it has direct uh, impact on the volume, but here we have the direct relationship between the when you have the higher R, when the nominal rate of interest is higher, then it is bound to happen that the people will use more of credit card, less of cash, so holding of cash will increase. But if, if it is going to be lent in the market, then this earning, whatever increase you have earning, this will further induce the, the consumers to save or lend more of a cash. So, holding of cash is increasing with the rise of the at the rate of interest. So, the, this is how we often mention about the transaction demand for money. This is what we it shows about. Now, if I work out with the Fisher equation that we have mentioned that your real rate of interest is nothing but the nominal rate of interest minus inflation. So, if I am going to work out with this, then how it looks like? Suppose, for example, we assume that the inflation rate is 0. So, once I am assuming that the inflation rate is 0, then we can say that the demand for money is nothing but your P L Y R and it is all since it is 0. So, you can think about it is R, R is positive. So, in this setup, this is how it looks like that if you are going to deal with R. So, so far we have been able to drive the demand for money scenario, the nominal demand for money scenario. Now, we will be seeing that can we also understand and bring out the dimensions of the supply side, that how supply side is decided, which all factors play a very important role. So, we can spend some time. So, here what we are saying that we are introducing government here. So, there is a government and this government is having the responsibility of dealing with both monetary policy and the fiscal policy. Monetary policy, you must be knowing that it works on the rate of interest scenario. So, one of the objectives of the monetary policy is to is to control the inflation, how inflation is going to be decided. Fiscal side comes from the taxations. If taxation is going to be higher, then the government is going to get more income and this will further increase the expenditure. So, those dimensions are uh, analyzed. So, let us work out with the budget constraint of the government. In the current period, the government purchases G units of good and pays the nominal interest rate and principal to the government debt outstanding from the last period. So, here if I am using B minus, B minus in, in, in the sense that you have here you have this the minus 
as a superscript. So, here if I am going to have this uh, superscript here, then this shows that this is the outstanding amount B minus which is carrying forward from the previous period. So, this particular amount is being sold by the government in the previous period. Once you, are, you must be knowing that once you are selling the bond, whatever coupon outstanding that you have attached with the bond, you will be paying in future. So, th this is the carry forward from previous period, maturity is happening in the current period. So, 1 plus R will be attached. So, this is how we, it works out. So, here you have the expenditure side. So, this is the expenditure side of the government and this is the income of the government. Here you have the price into the government expenditure. So, this is the nominal government expenditure we have plus 1 plus R minus into B minus. So, this bond has been issued in the past and this is the return that the bond is offering. So, this is the future of value of the bond issued or I would say current value of the bond issued in the previous period. So, maturity is taking place in the current period. So, we are we can understand in that way. This is also the nominal tax that the government is charging from individual. This is the bond issued in the current period. So, there is no minus attached here. Plus, here you have the growth or the rate of change in the money supply. So, all these factors are important. So, here you have the income and here you have the expenditure. Now, once I am saying about the income and expenditure, so this money supply which is exogenous, this will be decided by the central bank. These two will come from the uh, the uh, government sources and B may also be linked with the money supply because if you are thinking about buying and selling a bond, then this also matters in the open market operation. So, there will we'll again be, be taking into account, especially with regard to the liquidity trap. So, to understand this is the equation that we can derive based on the the intertemporal scenario that we have. So, PT denotes the nominal taxes. So, this is what we are getting and uh, once we get this then we are here we have the demand for money. So, demand for money it looks like this whenever you have demand for money price will shoot up and this we have the, the direct relationship with regard to the uh, nominal money supply. But more or less if you have the a real income increasing then the, this is what happens that if you have price is here if the rightward shift in the line then here price is going to be lower and then here you have the money demand increasing. So, these two factors I hope you are able to understand that if I am saying about the money demand increasing which means that holding of the cash but the moment you see decline in prices people tend to use more of cash and they will be again using for for transaction. So, which means that demand for money will also increase. So, here you have the this much demand. If you have a rightward shift, the price will come, a price will be lower and then here you will have the demand for money coming like this. So, here you have the rightward shift. I will again be focusing on here. So, I will be now completing this session here and I will stop here and I hope we have able to understand the monetary intertemporal model. I will continue from here in the next session. Thank you. Thank you so much for your attention.